Yes, this is the uh, this is the community meeting, as you see it here, the benefits of right sizing plumbing in homes and apartment buildings. And uh, it just this is a, it's sponsored or hosted by Passive House California. Thank you for uh, the, the Passive House Network and Kim, who has been handling it up to here and doing the technology for us. We also are part of the IFA and the Passive House Institute. And we always like to start off by thanking our, our sponsors. Uh, we have the Small Planet Supply, Minotaire and Earthbound Homes, our silver sponsors. And we have uh, a number of uh, supporting sponsors, 475 Building Performance, Mitsubishi, uh, Fergus Garber Architects, Ream, Stiebel Eltron, Pete Moffat Construction, the Heinrich team as a local re as a realtor, uh, Hayward, uh, Hayward uh, uh, Lumber, uh, CBHBA, Good Space, Prosoco, Rockwool, and Intelligent Membrane. So thank you to our supporting sponsors. I will uh, we'll, we'll click one more, and instead of the call to action, which comes at the end, I'm going to unshare, and it'll be, we can put uh, Gary and Christoph uh, back in charge. Thank you, Jay. Um, can you hear me now? Are we good? Great. I'm going to start sharing the screen um, while I'm doing that. I'm Gary Klein with Gary Klein and Associates. Um, I've been in hot water for a little over 30 years. Well, longer if you count how long I've been married. I have kids too. Um, but we're going to talk about plumbing systems because of the work that I've been doing with uh, with Christoph and IATMO for some time. We have a bunch to share about what's happening with right-sizing plumbing. Christoph, why don't you introduce yourself while I get the slides up? Certainly. My name is Christoph Lohr. Uh, professional engineer uh, based out of Phoenix, Arizona, but also licensed in the state of California. And I am vice president of technical services and research with IATMO and head up our technical services and research team, which did a lot of the legwork behind the, I guess, presentation we're going to be focusing on today. There we go. You should be seeing my screen. Is that correct? I see it. Yeah. Life is good. So exciting. So one of the things we want you to do is to put in the chat any key questions you would like us to try and answer today as they come to you. We'll save those kinds of questions for the chat time, which is later in the presentation. And as Kim mentioned, we are interested in any clarifying questions you have. You don't understand something on slide seven, get it out quickly so we can try and answer the question before it gets lost in your brain. Daryl will be monitoring the chat to make sure we get those questions as early as we can. Um, and so with that, I think we should get started. Benefits of right-sizing plumbing in homes and apartment buildings. What are we aiming for? Uh, does this less seem about right to you, Christoph? People want the things to feel right. Toilets to flush first time every time, clean clothes and bodies. Service of hot water efficiently. What about the second question? You and I have talked about this before. It doesn't really matter, does it? If the things don't work, who cares how efficient they are, right? Yeah. The first one, the, the first has to happen. The second is the added delay. Yes, that's exactly right. And so I like to keep this in mind as we do this right sizing. We want to make sure people get what they want and what they need. So this slide is pretty interesting. Um, there was a project done on the drain line carry of solid waste in buildings that you can see at the bottom there. Um, it was the... What is it? The Plumbing Engineering Research Coalition or something like that. The Perk Studies in California, looking at drain line carry. But as part of that, they did a, a compilation of water use over 1980 to 2011. And if you look at it, there's a bunch of stuff in California there for Cal Green. But you can see that since the 1980s, there have been reductions in flow rates or flush values from 50 to 96%. Those are huge reductions. But during that same time, the sizing methodology and the plumbing code have not been adjusted. The baseline code math has never been adjusted until fairly recently. And we're going to talk about the recent adoption of the new stuff and its implications for California. Um, I don't think we have to pick any one of these in particular, but these are huge, huge differences. So, Christoph, this is for you. You take over for a bit here. Excellent. Thanks, Gary. Well, as Gary alluded to, the and this question comes up often is, you know, haven't we spent time with the last several, you know, after the last several decades in terms of updating plumbing systems? And we have on the outlet side. 
But if you look at a building from 10, 20, 40, 80 years ago, the methodology that was used to size the piping system serving those fixtures is largely the same. And really what it comes down to is this particular report that was done by Dr. Roy Hunter at that time as a, it was a research project that was issued by the National Bureau of Standards as part of the United States Department of Commerce. And that was what led to ultimately his research is what led to what you see there on the left is what we all know in the industry as the hunter's curve uh, and that was embedded in that report bms 65 which as you can see at the bottom was issued on december uh, if my eyes are not seeing me 16th 1940. so that has been the methodology which we have used to size buildings or to size excuse me size the plumbing systems the water systems in buildings, in all buildings across the U.S. since 1940. It's in essence been codified in every single model code, including the California Public Code. <laughs> now, at the time when Dr. Roy Hunter did his research, it was revolutionary because up until that time, the way to size piping systems was to assume that every plumbing fixture was on simultaneously. So as an example, if we had a bank of lavatories or a bank of water closets of toilets and they were flush valve those flush valve toilets will have a flow rate of about you could say 25 gallons per minute not the not lavatories are much lower than that but even back then flush valve water closets about 25 gallons per minute now if you had 10 of them that's 10 times 25 gallons per minute which equals 250 gallons per minute which would equate to a four inch water main to serve those 10 water closets what Dr. Roy Hunter did back in 1940 without a computer, basically just by math and an abacus, was he used statistical analysis to describe a congested use pattern, which significantly reduced the likelihood of simultaneous use. So by his mathematics, those 10 water closets, only two of 10 would be flowing simultaneously, which was a 99th percentile, which was a, a pretty amazing feat to do all without a computer. Uh, you know, at this time age, it, we, it's, I wouldn't even know where to start even as an engineer with all my differential equations. It, it's all calculator based stuff, but he was able to do that by hand. And that has been the basis of plumbing codes for the last 80 years. Now, that congested use pattern, I, I want to stay on that word for a second here. Let's let's take the, this bank of laboratories here. So what that assumes is that, you know, let's say I was at one of those laboratories and I was washing my hands. You know, I washed my hands, the fixture was on, I finished up, I stepped away, and someone like Gary stepped right after I left and started washing his hands. And then- At the Gary same fixture, him. right? The same fixture. And then he stepped mm -hmm. away. And then John stepped in. And then Richard, and then Steve, and then Kim. It's a, it's a, it's a consistent use. And every fixture in this bank of- laboratories of these one, two, three, four, five, six, one off screen here, six laboratories, every single fixture had that kind of line after it and that kind of use pattern. Now, what building type does that remind you of in terms of how it, those plumbing fixtures are actually used? Anybody want to chime in? A sports stadium at halftime, but do homes work like sports stadiums at halftime? No, they do not. And this is what the entire purpose behind the water demand calculator was to really start evaluating what the true peak flow rate was. Now, as a plumbing design professional, somebody that sized hundreds of plumbing systems, probably thousands at this point in my career, I can tell you that there's two main criteria for sizing a water system. It is your peak flow rate and your available pressure. Those two are the key critical criteria, criteria critical criteria in sizing a pipe system. You need those two. That's when you start dive dovetailing to Hayes Williams equation and all the rest. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, Marisha has it totally right. School, opera house, intermission. Yes, congested use, but a home doesn't have that. Not even during the Super Bowl. There's data out there that shows that it's not even during the Super Bowl. You have that kind of uh, peak flow rate. And also not, not during the holidays. Our bathrooms and, and the fixtures in a home just don't have that kind of usage pattern. And so that impetus of the research was, was to try to get a better estimation of peak flow rate. And that's what IATMO did. Next slide, please, Gary. 
So starting in 2017 with the Water Efficiency and Sanitation Standard, and then following suit in the 2018 Uniform Plumbing Code, um, and has been since adopted in the 21 and 2024 Uniform Plumbing Codes, has been separated into its own standalone document that you can see there, uh, IAPMO UPC Appendix M 2021. The Water Demand Calculator was released, and this was the first time in about 80 years that we have right-sized uh, and really much more accurately estimated the peak flow rate. Now, when I say estimate, we have to realize that when we calculate a peak, peak flow rate from a, a mathematical and an engineering perspective, we always want our, our estimated peak flow rate to be above the true peak flow rate. As long as that condition exists, sizing of piping systems, there can be confidence there that we're not undersized. And, and that is exactly what we achieved. And Gary will touch on that in a few slides a little bit later, to, just in terms of the, the, the confidence of, you know, the confidence that someone can have in terms of the, the safety factor in the water demand calculator. Since the original development of the water demand calculator, which utilized thousands of homes across the country as data points, and since has been validated by, by Gary's efforts and many other engineers and design professionals and, and installers and inspectors, we've seen immense growth and adoption of the water demand calculator. And ultimately, that ultimately includes California, which this year in July 1st of 2024, in the intervening code cycle, will officially have adopted the water demand calculator as an approved way to size peak flow rates to estimate and right size water systems. That QR code there on the website, that is where you can go to download the water demand calculator for free. Uh, there's also a number of helpful studies and how-to manuals and additional supplemental information which you may find of interest, some of which we'll touch on during the rest of this presentation. I'll let, I see some folks grabbing their phones, so I'll go ahead and let you uh, get that QR code. Oh, oh sorry, let me that? back up. Yeah, I saw John trying get to get it, which I love. So we were able to get it, There's John? There's the QR code thing. And just a note that uh, 30 minutes to the FAQ, the Q&A. Perfect. Keep us on time. All right. Can I move to the next slide? We'll bring the QR code up at the end if we have to. Definitely. We'll make sure it's and, available. And really, the early adopters were, were many, uh, including uh, one gentleman by the name of P uh, Peter Skinner. And Gary, I think this is where you were going to sort of discuss some of those early adopters and stories. Right. So this is a project in upstate New York, which, by the way, is not a uniform plumbing code jurisdiction. Um, but the engineer of record was very interested in right sizing. So we were able to put it into this project in phase two. Building E is one of the buildings that we measured a lot. And my colleague, Pete Skinner, had been measuring peak flow rates in this building. That's a 35-unit apartment building, senior housing. Um, and I'm going to ask you, Christoph and others a question in a little bit. All of you a question is how many, what do you think the peak flow rate in that 35-unit apartment would be? Um, we got to start the project when they were here in construction in phase two. Christoph, is this a little late to do engineering of plumbing? <laughs> a lot of engineers uh, do not like that that timing of when you're in this part of the uh, project, but uh, they'll make they'll probably make uh, the best of a, of a good situation. Yeah, so we were asked to right size the plumbing when the walls were up and started on the other one. It was a little late, so we couldn't move anything in the buildings. We would have liked to have moved some of the fixtures for better time to tap and things like that, but that wasn't a possibility. We we're given a floor plate and a floor plan, and we had certain paths we could run the plumbing in, and that was pretty much it. So we had to live with what was there, but we did get a chance to right-size it. Um, so here's the question. A 24-unit apartment building, a 35-unit apartment building, and a 40-unit apartment building, would anyone like to put in the chat what they think the peak flow rate would be for the hot water system or the cold, it doesn't matter, um, for each of these buildings? I'll start looking at the chat while you think about it. And Christoph, you can't answer knowing what you know about the water demand calculator. I was hoping you have to, to pretend you don't know anything. So let's ask the question this way. How many showers do you think will be on at the same time in a 24 unit apartment building? Two of them, 10 of them, all of them. No guesses. I see two from Steve Mann. 20, 30, and 35. Two, that was from Bronwyn. Two from Rick Sawyer. Okay, so let's just keep moving on. We won't get stuck here. We'll look at the answers as they come. 
here are the three measured data points for the 24, 35, and 40 unit apartment building. Here's what the plumbing code predicts for the 35 unit apartment building for the project we were on. This is what the ASHRAE modified method predicts. This was version one of the water demand calculator, which was all we had available at the time, Christoph. And version two came out after the project had already been built. Yeah. And so um, we were using version one and we predicted 16 gallons a minute instead of 52 gallons a minute on the hot side. We measured, never have measured more than three gallons per minute in that apartment building. The whole building, not that's the whole shoot and match, not just one apartment. The huge, huge difference. And so we felt comfortable that we could actually do some right sizing work here. And we were able to take a three inch main for that building down to a one and a half inch main based on version one. For the whole building, we did the right sizing for the cold side too, but the hot side was already at two and a half or three inches, which is nuts. So Pete's epiphany back then is if the flows are so low, why are the pipes so big? And this was back in 2019. The water demand calculator had been issued in 2017. So this is early days. And we have a friend named Todd Kukta who's out of California. And his corollary is the peak flow rates are only 20 gallons a minute. How come the drains are sized for 200 gallons a minute? That's our next project is to work on the drain side. Because inches and gazoutas have to be sort of related. And they are now in the codes, but we haven't done the work to figure out the math for the, the drains. We're working on it. So for California... As I said earlier, someone saw me make this presentation about four years ago um, about the project in upstate New York. And they called me after the presentation and said, what do we need to do to get more dots? We had three dots four years ago. We now have 20 on the same graph that we're going to share with you now. And the report you can see is available uh, at this website. And it is this report and the work we did associated with it through uh, 2050 partners and the research coalition, the, 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 the Title 24 uh, coalition that works on codes and standards in California, that we were able to make this project possible and get the adoption done. So Christoph, that line at the top is the conversion between the WSFUs and the Hunter's curve in gallons per minute on the left, right? And yep. that's from 1940. These numbers have never changed. The fixture W, this water supply fixture unit values have not been changed in the California plumbing code since 1940. Yeah, and other places in the U.S. Uh, they changed slightly, but again, the underlying premise anytime the Hunter's curve was used was that the building was operating like a sports stadium at halftime. So even with some of those changes, it right. didn't really reduce. didn't make a difference. Do you see the black dots along the x-axis? Jay and Kim, you see those? They're not really close to the red line, are they? Really far away. They look like little ants. Let's look at the left-hand corner of the graph. Now you can actually read the letters in the black dots, and they're still not anywhere close to the red line. And the red line is what we've been using to size the water pipes in all these buildings all over the country. So here's a chart where we're looking at a more specific look at each building type. There's black dots, which are the 99th percentile measured peak flow. There's the water demand calculator predictions in the blue crosses, and the red crosses are the, the Appendix A predictions in the California Plumbing Code. And you can see that even though the water demand calculator predictions are closer to the measured performance than the red crosses are, they still provide a safety margin of almost two to six times. In structural engineering terms, a factor of 100% safety, two to one is a big, big difference. Um, we don't need 10 to one or 20 to one in plumbing. We, it's just not needed. Anyhow, these are all there and they're for your you know, edification later on. You can study them all you'd like. This building G is the one we showed you pictures of. This is a, this is a building E in, in the Meadows project. Here's the underlying data set, the monitored apartments, the monitoring period. You can do all the math and play all the games you'd like with the numbers, but the, the, the essentials are here. The plumbing code overestimates the peak by an average more than a factor of 10, ranging from five to 27 times. It's a huge overestimate. And we pay for that privilege in the first cost and we pay for it over time in lots of issues related to plumbing. Christoph will get to those in a little bit. 
And for those who really want to look at what's going on with these buildings, we know the type and the occupancy type and all that stuff. You can read it. I'm not going to go through it now. Christoph, it's up to you. Let's talk about benefits for a while. <laughs> so in terms of right sizing, there's, there's, I want to focus on sort of two sets of benefits. Uh, first off, as Gary mentioned, first cost, uh, which also impacts ongoing costs. The second is sustainability benefits, which I think is probably what most of you all are interested in here. But I would make an argument that this, that, that the water demand calculator, because of the, the, the science and the need for it and, and just how long we've been using the other method, the hunter's curve method, it's really offered one of those, the few, I guess you could say win, win, win solutions when it comes to, to innovation, um, especially in the realm of plumbing. You know, there's, we have multiple things we have to worry about. Yes, when we talk about building resiliency as a whole and codes and standards, we have to be concerned about, you know, earthquakes and, and hurricanes and other sudden, sudden disasters. But we have three other criteria that we really have to look at. One is water safety. Uh, we need to make sure that the plumbing systems are safe because we ingest water that comes from, from our plumbing systems. We use it. It touches our skin. We also have to worry about sustainability. There's regional shortages. I live in Phoenix. Uh, Colorado River is an issue for us, as long as, along with all of you in California. We also have to worry about affordability. We can't gold plate the systems. We need to find ways to make sure that systems are affordable and sustainable at the same time. And right sizing of plumbing systems is really a great opportunity to do three of these things. Uh, and I'm going to focus on two of those, which is cost and sustainability. So first off, is that Gary I mentioned is that we need to make sure that it works. And the beautiful part is not only does it work, but it improves performance. As, as Gary mentions here in, in that 92 unit apartment building, the time to tap, so the delivery time to get hot water from the water heater or the hot water source to the shower, to the faucet, that all improved. Uh, increased satisfaction because the time came down. We had less water going to the drain. We'll touch on that from a sustainability aspect. But in terms of the right so side, off, just, yes. just to interject briefly on this one, in this particular analysis, we did not do anything to change the layouts in the 92 apartments. We left the layouts exactly as they were. All we got to do is to change pipe size. If you also can do architectural compactness analysis and repair and fixing of that in the design, you can get another win as well. But this is just pipe to pipe comparisons. Distances remain the same. Yep. But as you can see, the right sizing for the piping, you know, uh, thousands of dollars in savings for this 92 unit apartment complex. Uh, the water heater, uh, the smaller water heater, because you have less heat losses, that was savings there. The water meter itself, in addition to the water heater. Uh, so hopefully I enunciated that well enough. Uh, there were savings there too. Uh, water meter impact, these are real. And so total first cost savings was in the range of, you know, as you can see here, um, you know, 60 to over 100,000. Uh, we also had first cost savings per apartment and annual operation savings, which did not include energy and sewer. Again, a lot of water rates are tied to your water meter size. Next slide, please. Now, additional operational savings was that in order to get the savings, the building needs to be built as designed. And so the commissioning begins with the design and includes inspections during construction. Uh, if you want to just put out the whole list on the, on the chart there. So when you go through that, the savings, water, Savings again, smaller meter reduces monthly fixed charges. You get more accurate readings of how much water you're using. Larger meters are notoriously inaccurate at smaller flows. So having a meter that's smaller will capture those smaller flows more, which may be able to prevent leaks. There's also less volume of water from, you know, from mechanical closets and, and piping to deliver water, uh, hot water to arrive at apartments. You know, sewer charges are often proportional to the water used. And so typically a smaller water meter will also result in lower sewer costs uh, per gallon of water. The other part is energy. You know, there is a water energy in Nexus. Uh, we've talked about this, I think, for quite a bit over the last 10, 20 years as an industry. And when you have smaller piping, your surface area of that pipe decreases, which means in hot water systems, you have less surface area to dissipate to the space, which saves energy. Uh, it also helps keep the water hot at lower flow rates to get to, to the various pictures that it serves. Next slide, please. Again, to Gary's point, you know, the part of the floor plan, you know, the, the designing for modern pipe and fittings, 
uh, pressure independent valves, anti scald showers, and tubs. These are all additional concepts that could be put into a design. Uh, you know, obviously, ideally through through the design process, but also could be done in many cases throughout the commissioning process as well. These all would work well with right sizing of plumbing systems. Gary, so Christoph. Yeah, yeah. The anti scald shower and tub shower valves are now required in the plumbing code, right? These are the ASSE ten sixteen valves, right? Yes. I, I don't know about you. I remember doing the shower dance. I was never very <laughs> good at it, and I really don't like it. Yes. And that dance is gone because of these valves. I think it's a good safety measure. Yep. <laughs> and as some yeah. of you have heard me talk before, pressure independent faucets and shower heads means that as pressure changes throughout your shower, you won't notice. And I think that people should get first dibs on water when pressure drops because someone's turned on too many things at one time. And so I like to see pressure independent faucets and shower heads, the aerators and the flow regulators in them uh, as part of the process. And I would recommend it in all specs. Yes. Um, the other thing I wanna to touch briefly on is the design for modern pipe and fittings. The plumbing codes have minimum allowable pressure at different fixtures, right? The critical pressure that you mentioned earlier, Christoph. Um, and I would observe, I think that number is in the 10 to 20 range PSI at the, the critical fixtures. Um, that was also written down before we had anti scald shower valves and never been changed. And the observation I would make is that if you only have 20 PSI at your shower valve, you're going to have a really bad feeling shower it won't work very well because they're designed at 80. It's a problem. We have to work on this as we do the right sizing. We have to make sure we have the right available pressures. So let's go on to the next one. Definitely. So in a much more, I should, to try to quantify even more some of the potential construction and energy and system water savings, IATMO worked with industry partners to come up with three reports. Uh, the first one, uh, the one on the left was one done with Stantec consultants, uh, which captured the material cost savings, uh, just just pipe inside buildings that utilize the water demand calculator. And three prototype buildings, a single family home, six unit multifamily and a 45 unit multifamily were selected. And we found savings working with Stantec uh, based on RS means in the range of five to 15% uh, pipe materials uh, in all instances. Now, worth noting is that was based on pre-COVID rates for materials. So we would anticipate that some of those savings may actually increase um, due to some of the cost of construction materials at this time. Closely released alongside the Stantec report was the Alliance for Water Efficiency, a review of connection, uh, connection fees and service charges by meter size, which looked at the concept of how much construction cost savings you could have if you right size the water meter, uh, which found, again, ranges from hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for a single family home up to over a hundred thousand for a, let's say large, you know, 100, 200 unit multifamily that reduced pipe size from, you know, two nominal pipe sizes for the, for the meter size. So uh, massive potential construction cost savings um, on an individual and multifamily load basis. And then just last year, IATMO worked with Arup to release a sustainability study of the water demand calculator and impacts of right sizing. And we looked at that concept of if you reduce your time to tap and you reduce hot water delivery times at showers and lavatories and sinks, what would be your water and energy savings? Uh, there's, an, I think we found about 24 different studies by peer-reviewed um, folks out there, including Jim Lutz uh, from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory back in 2011, 2014, that, that did some initial work on this. And we used that as a basis to try to put some numbers to this. We found for a single family home, right around 500 gallons per year of water could be saved just by right sizing uh, and, and reducing that structural water waste and reducing the delivery time of hot water from a water heater to a sink. And that was just on one prototype. So those numbers may vary. Again, there's other devices, as Gary mentioned, that could maybe work. Uh, IGC is three, I'm trying to remember the number here, 324, uh, which is a device that can actually turn off the shower once bathing temperature is reached. Uh, and they pull a tab and it opens water again. That could combine really well in this case to 
eliminate behavioral water waste on top of structural water waste. So there's there's opportunities for further savings here uh, when it comes to water and energy and, and reduce the the usage and the uh, the amount of impact we have from a water and energy standpoint. Uh, again, time check, you have about 12 minutes till the Q&A. Excellent. Perfect. Go ahead, Gary. Next slide. Yep. So, yes, um, yeah, so it turns out that we were successful in our petition to the state. We started the petition three years ago. We missed the first window, and that gave us time to develop the report that got us to this point. Um, our report that we mentioned earlier in the slides also has information about water and energy savings. We didn't go to the extent of calculating carbon, which everyone would want us to do at this stage, but carbon's related to energy, so it's pretty straightforward to get an estimate for that. Um, we looked at both single and multifamily, mostly at multifamily, but the math is there and it's supportive in all cases. Um, and so, as Christoph mentioned, it will become available for use in the California Plumbing Code, effective July 1st this year. Um, and here is a, a short teaser of what's in the, uh, the, the amendment. We were able to make a small change in Chapter 6, Section 610.5. Um, and you can actually look at the California Plumbing Code for 2022. It's, that's what it's called um, online. Uh, Christoph, can you look up that link? I think there's an EPUBS link we can go look at somewhere. Put that in the chat. That would be helpful for people. I forgot to put it here. Um, so we had to fix chap chapter six. So it clearly refers to the use of Appendix M, which it didn't before. Now it does. And you can see the, the table here in table M102.1 has been modified from the Uniform Plumbing Code Appendix to match the legal flow rates in California, because California has slightly different ones than the Uniform Plumbing Code puts in for the rest of the country. This is what we've done. It doesn't look like much, and it isn't in text terms, but it's a really big deal for both single and multifamily apartments, multifamily buildings. To date, to our knowledge, there are over 5,000 single family homes that have been built using the water demand calculator, most of them in and around Sacramento because one of the biggest plumbers decided this was a good idea and started to show it to the jurisdictions three or four years ago now, and they've been building ever since that way. Apartment buildings, we're still waiting to see the first ones in California to use it. So, oops. Gary, did you just want to copy yeah. the 2022 California Plumbing Code, or was there specific? No. Yeah, the yeah, just put the the link to the California Plumbing Code. They can look up Chapter Six and Appendix M. <laughs> so the next steps, um, we need your help for two things. I'm going to cover what's going on for multifamily, and Christoph, you can talk about the other stuff we're trying to get at IATMO for the extension of this. Excuse me. For multifamily, we're looking now for people that want to be early adopters. If you've got projects that are going to hit the streets sometime later this year or early next, we'd like to help you think through how to use the water demand calculator for those projects so that you can see the benefits of right sizing for them and make that case to the, the development group you're working with. Um or the single family home builders that you're working with or the homes that you're designing. All of this makes sense, you should try it. The water demand calculator is a simple uh, spreadsheet tool that you can use and input. We'll set up separate classes. In fact, we're doing, planning that now so that you can do in-person and online training to learn how to use the water demand calculator for projects. All of that stuff is coming, but if you're interested, reach out to, to, to Jay uh, and he'll get in touch with Christoph and I and we'll help you get to the to the finish line with projects that can be designed using the water demand calculator. That's really a big deal for us. We wanna see people to be, we need to find early adopters in California. So we're excited about that. Uh, Christoph, what did you wanna say about the other stuff for next steps? I'm sorry, my computer's acting stupid. No, what about the other occupancies? Yeah, so, so currently the water demand calculator only applies to residential occupancies. So that would be, I think it's R2 and R3, so single family homes or, or multifamily apartments and condos. 
we do get a lot of questions about other building types and there's some that are starting to cross that divide and some design professionals that are starting to use it. Although, you know, it's not per, in the code per se, but, you know, especially like dormitories that end up being more like an apartment complex, um, not like the, the old school dormitories. Um, those have been used successfully. Um, assisted living, um, especially that resembles multifamily. That's another one. Um, but we are working on taking this exact same approach and applying it to other commercial buildings. So offices, schools, universities, healthcare, hospitality. Uh, and we, we have a pretty good effort underway at this time to get right size into these other building types, uh, other non-residential commercial type of buildings. And so we're really excited about that process there. And, and you know, there's an opportunity, you know, not only to take the water demand calculator and apply it to your next projects, but also if, if there's an interest to help help us find buildings with that would be willing to let us put a meter on. We have flow meters that we've purchased and leased and and have had donated to us by volunteers and 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 various partners and, and collaborators on this project. So there's an opportunity for us if we can get the uh, you know hundreds of buildings, uh, which we have a pathway right now towards. Uh, we can do this exact same thing for the commercial spaces, and where that's something we're very excited about. All right, let's go on to questions. So Cyril, we've been looking at the chat. Do you want to take over going through the questions and? Let's start at the beginning and work our way down the list, if that's okay with you. And then we'll open it up to the floor. Yes, sure. Um, Jay, you are more, uh, because my English is not very good, so maybe people will not understand what I'm saying. So um, I've seen. So the first question Hold on, I'm working backwards. So what goes into the public code? What about Calgreen and Titan 24? Right now, this is shown in the plumbing code. Because if the plumbers don't understand it, it won't get built, even if you put it in Calgreen in the energy chapter. Um, and so what's happened in Seattle is an interesting option for California. Christoph just gave a seminar on this past weekend up there. You want to talk about that for a minute about what they've done in their energy code? Yeah, Gary, yeah, we'd be happy to. So, so this last weekend, Saturday, myself and a few other colleagues on the technical services and research team, we we headed out to Seattle to give a presentation on the water demand calculator. And the reason for sort of the, the show in force was Seattle, to our knowledge, has become the first jurisdiction to mandate the use of the water demand calculator uh, for R2 occupancy. So for single family homes, Hunter's Curve, or the water demand calculator are allowed, but for multifamily, because of the, uh, as you could see, the as the extreme range of, of Gary's results that, that he was presenting earlier, um, they wanted to lock in the savings. They didn't even want to have the potential to miss out on those energy and water and, and embodied carbon savings. And so they ended up mandating it for all R2 occupancies. So uh, moving forward here, uh, about the halfway point during this year, right around the same time, uh, we're hearing as when the water demand calculator officially is going to be adopted in the state of California. It will be mandated in Seattle King County for all multifamily buildings. And, and any designs of those plumbing systems or water systems will have to incorporate the water demand calculator in order for them to, to capture those energy and water savings. Cool. It's something to consider for California. Um, I have been working in our field of changing people's attitudes and behaviors and construction practices in energy and water for 50 years. And my observation is if you mandate something too soon, people get mad at you. And so we want to capture the savings. I want to have people learn how to do it while they can still like make mistakes at it. But sometime soon, California is going to do what, probably going to do what Seattle has done and require the use of the water demand calculator for all building, large building types for sure, because the numbers are so, so big. The potential wins are enormous. And there's no reason not to use it in single family as well. I mean, we've already proven it can be done. Um, I'm looking at the other questions. I see one from Joe Stuman. John Stuman, sorry. Uh, is there a retrofit way to save water? John, I need you to modify the question a little bit. Um, is this about single family or multifamily? Um, this just, is about a house that I'm in right now in Truckee that we built about 20 years ago. And unfortunately, we used a three-quarter inch pipe to get from 
the mechanical room to a distant shower. And probably we only needed half inch. So there's some waste of water when you turn on the, the, the shower, yeah. let's say. And yeah. so, and we didn't do a loop system. So is Got there it. kind of a, yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask that we take this offline, John, and I'll happily oh. answer your question um, because I spend my life helping people fix their buildings. And so I'll help you with your question. Um, my last, the last slide will have my contact info, reach out and, and then you can, we'll have this conversation. Um, Great. I need to ask a bunch more questions. Um, so you, Lavanya, it has been adopted for residential occupancies. This is good. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. It's only taken three years. It's pretty quick. One cycle. Yeah. One, the one cycle is the quickest you can do, by the way, takes a cycle. We manage. It's great news. And I'm happy to work with you and your firms and others on this call, obviously, to help make it happen. Um, Thank you. And so the question earlier about what about Cal Green and Title 24, Steve, I think we've tried to answer that for the moment. Cal Green sets fixture flow rates. Those are incorporated into the water demand calculator math for the Appendix M. And Title 24 Energy is trying to figure out what they're going to do to give compliance credits for single and multifamily. So far, they've mostly only got multifamily. Um, Ron, when you asked a question about, would it be different if the building was a college dorm? And the question is, does the dorm look like apartments or does it look like you go down the hall to share the showers? And we don't have the math for the share of the shower case. We have the math for the dorm, that the dorms that look like apartments. It will work there. Um, <laughs> Bronwyn, that's a tongue-in-cheek question about does it mean our codes aren't updated fast enough to represent reality? Um, I agree. Um, so then, Mar Marisha, you have something about, so this would be something the engineer or plumbing contractor would provide in a bid for shop drawing, shop drawing discussion, further understanding needed by the inspector, et cetera, for approval. The answer is yes, but Christoph and I and several others are working on an implementation plan for the early adopters so that we're planning to hold webinars. First one that's much like this one, which we'll call the lunch and learn kind of thing. And the second ones will be for those that need or want to learn more, the how to do it webinars. Some of them will be in person and combined with webinars. We're still sorting all that out. That will happen sometime next quarter is what we think. And we'll continue to do that for several quarters as we go forward. Um, so that people can learn how. And that group includes all of the actors in the process. So we have, Christoph, what do we have? We have architects, we have engineers, we have developers. We have, oh, you're, you're a plumbing engineer. You're supposed to be in the room too, right? Um, and then the building inspectors have to be there. It turns out that the rule is that the chief building inspector has to agree. Because if the chief building official doesn't agree, it doesn't matter what the plumbing inspector thinks. And so we have all these people we need to reach so they learn how it works and why it works and that it's a safe thing to do. We still have a safety margin built in. So um, it would be great for value engineering. And if you've got a project that's having trouble, value engineering, the plumbing is a really big win. It's allowed. I would make the case that even if you're in value engineering now for a project that has to go forward between now and August, <coughs> I would look at the water demand calculator because well, now that it's code, everyone can see it, right, Christoph? Yep. And as long as they can see it, they can decide if they're willing to accept its use. AHJs have authority to do it. And uh, James Gagnon, you are correct. It's a similar idea of diversity factor in, in electricity and engineering, electrical engineering. Huh. So suburban community water systems, when a wildfire is threatening and the residents turn their hoses on the building, should we consider the value of offering external water sprinkler systems? I don't understand that question exactly. Okay, Gary, let me elaborate. Um, if you have a community, I'm in Truckee right now, but California has a lot of communities that are threatened by wildfires. Sure. So if... If people are concerned about their property and they turn on a sprinkler system at their house 
and everybody does it, and then they get in their car and leave, chances are that the sprinkler's demand is going to exceed the supply capacity of the town water supply. So there are companies that are offering self-contained systems that provide water storage, power, battery, backup, everything to inundate a structure without any demand on the town water system. So I'm wondering about how uh, these kinds of things, because this whole conversation is about demand. Well, if everybody is afraid for their property, they could over exceed the demand. So something like uh, systems that can inundate the buildings could be of benefit, but there's no recognition of any of that stuff in the California code at this it, at this time. It's just people just doing it. Yeah, it's a that's a messier problem, John. Um, you are correct that if everybody turns on their sprinklers, the system is going to have a fit. Um, because it's not designed for that. It's designed for this 99th percentile peak, kind of a congested peak. But if everybody does it, system water pressure in the whole town will go to he- go, go down towards zero and nothing's going to flow. <clears throat> so I think your idea is a very good one. That would be for a very interesting other session to have about what do you do in the case of when, when, when there's wildfires for water. Um, the next question from Cheryl is about are fire sprinklers included in the right size and calculations? The answer is no. They have their own section in the plumbing code. They have very specific rules to make sure that there's enough water coming out from the shower, the, the sprinklers in the room that's affected. That's how this plumbing, the fire sprinkler system is designed. And then Rebecca wants to know about can you talk more about water pressure? I was in under pressure in the areas of low pressure. Pipes need to be larger to provide adequate pressure for the house. I see larger pipes used in hilly areas and fire codes always seem to require larger pipes or sprinklers. Christoph, you want to help with that question? Sure. So Rebecca, you're keying in on on two good two I would, I would qualify as two different questions. So your first off, your point about low water pressure. Um, again, as I kind of alluded to at the start of my pre- um, of my conversation here with you all, is that peak flow rate and available water pressure are the two driving factors for size of the pipe. And so, if you have high available water pressure, then your pipe can shrink in size. If you have low available pro- water pressure, as you mentioned, then the pipe increases in size. Uh, comparatively, um, you know, uh, if you're looking at a you know like a given constant uh available pressure so the, the peak flow rate though does have an impact because it, you know if it has you know just as much if not more of a, of a impact than the available pressure um there's always opportunities for booster pumps and other things um especially in, in, in large scale multifamily that booster pumps are often common um but yes you're right in a general sense that that low pressure especially if you're at the top of a hill or an area, it would it would lead to an increased pipe size compared to at the bottom of the hill. But again, the, the peak flow rate has an equal, if not more, impact on on the original flow rate. So instead of you know having a difference between let's say a four inch and a three inch, let's say you might have a difference between a two inch and a one and a half inch, you know, based on the on the on the available pressure. Right. So, um, the other one you mentioned is the fire flows, um, and so. It depends on the type of building. So in, in most, in my, in my experience, most multifamily buildings have a separate fire sprinkler system from your domestic water use. And so once you split those two lines, when the water comes on site, then, then they stay separated. In some um, like townhomes, you may see an instance or, or single family homes, you may see a combined fire water line serving a couple of the sprinklers uh, and the water demand calculator, or excuse me, and, and the plumbing. The water demand calculator still has an impact. It's just not as great of an impact in that situation because really what happens is the fire line dictates the size of the of the water lines. And so you know, there's been arguments, well, that may not be the most sustainable option, um, you know, but also now you're also circulating water. So you don't just have water standing in pipes, which is also good. So that one is probably one that that, you know, 
there's a lot of discussion, I would say, out there from a technical standpoint. But in those instances, you will see savings, but it won't be as great for, for those instances. Gary, anything else? And it's, all, it, it's only on the cold water side for fire. Yeah. Um, I, I would observe that the pipes are sized. Cold water for fire is often done in CPVC as opposed to PEX or copper, just because of the way they, they tend to they build. And in the case of the CPVC, we've actually seen one manufacturer of CPC, CPVC piping that makes really long radius elbows. They're the only one in the country that's doing it. And that's going to allow them to come down one full pipe size in their fire sprinkler sizing because the impact of elbows need to be accounted for and really long radius sweeps you don't get the same effect. It's a much, much smaller uh, problem of pressure loss in the piping. So that will actually be very beneficial. Um, and for those that want to do a, a more depth on the pressure loss problem, we really do need to spend more time on it, but not today. Shower head flow rates that are listed in title in Cal Green and all around the country from manufacturers are based on a flow of pressure of 80 PSI. The plumbing code says you're not supposed to have more than 80 PSI going into the building. That means you will never get 80 PSI at your second floor shower. It's physically impossible. Okay. And so if you only have 40 PSI, which would be very typical in most buildings today, you're going to get 0.7 of the flow rate that you bought at 80 PSI. So if you thought you bought two gallons a minute, you're only going to get 1.4. If you only have 20 PSI, which is not uncommon at top floors and just places with low pressure to begin with, um, you're going to only have 0.7 of that again. So you're only going to have about one gallon per minute of flow. If you weren't happy with two, you're going to start screaming when the flow rate's only a gallon a minute. Everything was designed for the full rated pressure. And there's ways to improve that. But again, not for today's conversation. If you look up stuff that I've done before, I've been talking about this for several years. Let's go on to the other questions because we're getting close to finish. Steve, you're correct. It is not mandatory at the time. this time. It's voluntary. <laughs> so Cal Green is going to affect the flow rates. And Title 24 is probably going to give credits for those that start to try and use it. Um, eventually, I suspect that the Energy Commission is going to want to start mandating this like they're doing in Seattle now. Um, uh, I'm glad, Christopher, that you're talking to your clients now. We're looking for them. Rick, you said you've already had some projects where they've designed using it and the AHAs have permitted it. This is great. What jurisdictions are you in, Rick? If you're still on. Looks like he said Grover Beach. Okay, so I'm going to be in at Ferguson's tomorrow and Wednesday, yeah, tomorrow and Thursday in Southern California um, to do webinar sessions, not webinars, in-person sessions where we're teaching the plumbing community how to install heat pump water heaters. If any of you are interested in that, I'll get my stuff out now. I'm going to go past the chat and put our contact information up so you can look at it now while we're finishing. Um, both Christoph and I are willing to be reached out to. Um, Bronwyn, other than implementing this in our projects, what else can PHCA members think about? What can you do to help? You want to expand on that a little bit? Hey, Gary. Um, Hi, Bronwyn. Simply... Long time. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> just really, you know, like what else can we do to support moving this effort forward? Like what would help you know, to, to get the word um, out? I don't know. Is there something that you guys are hoping we can support you with um why don't you send me an email af after this so that we can figure out how to connect you with our team from the state we're, we're trying to develop a core group of people i think that socializing it on all of your projects whenever you talk with city officials like have you heard about this are you willing to, to you know would you like to hear more you can link them up that's the kind of thing to do i think on your website for phca it, it, passive house california we could put, maybe you could put links to what the upcoming trainings might be so that your members can learn more about it, that kind of thing. Uh, and more people can see it coming from your perspective, not just ours. Um, Rick, you had a question about um, 
individual branch sizing for CPC table 610.3. Um, I call them trunks, branches, and twigs. The plumbing code is a little bit unclear about what they mean by a branch that serves a single fixture. I call that a twig. The water demand calculator does not discuss the pipe serving one fixture, either hot or cold water. It only discusses branches that serve two or more fixtures or appliances where there's a possibility of simultaneity. So if we're talking about the pipe that feeds a single fixture, you need to use the California plumbing code. <laughs> we can have a debate about whether that's the right number too, but let's not fight that battle right now. Um, but for all branches that serve two or more, we can use the water demand calculator. Um, there are no fire sprinklers in the water demand calculator. That is correct. Just ignore it. It's for the pipe after the branch that goes to the fire sprinkler system. Um, and let's see. Thank you, Steve, man. Um, if you have a dorm where everyone showers in a short window, can you use smaller pipes on the runs but keep the large pipes on the mains? What I would ask, Debbie, is can we get into that building and measure it? If we can get into buildings that are dormitory-like and measure the peak flows, we'll get much more information to give everybody comfort with right sizing. I don't know what the answer is exactly, but I'm pretty sure that a four-inch main for most buildings is too big. It's just based on our experience with all of what we've got so far, that pipe almost never makes sense. Someone added up the math oddly. Um, huh. So this is um, from Christopher Barlow about the Monterey Peninsula has a water rationing system, doesn't allow for meetings to be upsized. So you wouldn't have to do upsizing. This is in fact gonna make it possible to take apartments that might've needed a four inch main to need a one and a half inch main. That's what the water demand calculator has shown us all over the country. And even on a more individual basis, um, you know, a single family home, I know ADUs are becoming more and more popular on a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, actually was looking at a house here uh, in my neighborhood here in Phoenix that did exactly that. They, they traded out the garage in the back and, and Put in the bones to put in an ADU in their in their backyard, uh, and uh, I was I, I was to say it was one of those moments where uh, was, you know talking to the realtor and, and they were bragging about how they just upsized the water meter and you know increased the sewer line to have capacity for the new ADU and I, I just was like I wish you would have called me um, didn't have to do that because uh, I'm assuming you used the the hunter's curve uh, which probably oversized it you probably had the, the existing house. Uh, probably was more than adequately sized. Uh, you wouldn't have had to touch it usually while using the water demand calculator. So one of those most where uh, the more you know. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're out of time officially. Cyril, did we do pretty good at getting to most of the questions? I know we missed one of yours. Yes, yes, no problem. Uh, I mean, depends on if people want to stay or uh, say, well, yeah. Uh, Jay, do you want to... Uh, <clears throat> I'm still good if if you want, my time is available for another five or 10 minutes. So if we want to hang on, we can. Up to you all. Why don't we do the sign off, but leave it open and uh, and, you, and you can be there to uh, to do so. Cool. Is that all right? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Let me just jump yes. on and uh, and share my, uh, share my, uh, my screen. You'll, uh, his, your yours won't come back up without without you re uh, reconnecting it. Oh, right. But uh, I want to just say uh, you know thanks everybody uh, you know for being here. It's a call to action. Is uh, th that was a Maya Angelou quote, quote? Do the best you can until you know better, and then when you know better, do better. We've learned some things today about uh, about better. And uh, I live in Monterey, so I've, that's going. I'm going to jump on that. In terms of supporting Passive House California. Uh, you can passivehousecal.org. You could get on and sign up for our newsletter. You could get a, um, an individual professional membership. You could have, we have organization company memberships. You could sponsor or donor. So just wanted to let that be there uh, with you uh, so that it's here. And then we'll let you go. Thank you all for your uh, for your time and attention. Uh, this is my own the info at passivehousecal.org, and this is my own uh, my own uh, email if you'd like to come to that. 
I will now jump off the uh, the share and thank you all for attending and we'll leave the meeting open uh, for five minutes until if there's more questions, but stay safe, everyone.